forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe of society. The candles are lit. The lights are down low. And it is now time for our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight. For the midnight. For lack. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Midnight Black Mass. I'm Dan the Dragon Wilson, and why am I not uh, setting the mood as I do or referring to uh, any of my managerial nicknames? That's because tonight we're talking exclusively about the Wild Side reunion that occurred this past weekend uh, in Cornelia, Georgia. It was a great time. I can't wait to get into the details and have a fun discussion here. Uh, no strong style psycho tank this week. Uh, he's tied up with other engagements tonight, uh, but he'll be back next week to give his perspective on the Wild Side reunion. He, uh, he certainly was heavily involved as well. And uh, Andrew Alexander also unavailable tonight. So it's myself and a very special guest co-host, the producer, the founder of the Beyond Ringside Radio Network, Fast Eddie Lane. How you doing, man? Wonderfully well. A little bit chilled, a little bit wet, but other than that, ready to have some fun. Yeah, that old dirty cuss Irma has uh, made her way up to the Tennessee Valley now. Uh, she's finally broken down. Not quite so ornery, but uh, certainly uh, pounding the area a little bit for now. We're, we have power. We're good. So what- uh, there's some, some high winds and heavy rains, but uh, we'll keep on trucking through the end of this hour to uh, bring you a a nice recap on all of the weekend's festivities. Um, And I I like always doing a co-host deal with Eddie because uh, he actually asks questions and not uh, the questions like Andrew Alexander asked to just sort of get a rise out of me, but like, you know, actual questions to where you, you can have an an informative discussion. Uh, So uh, really, I'm still blown away by the whole damn thing, to be honest with you. I'm kind of still in shock over it. Well, there's a lot to take into consideration because a little bit of time has passed since Wildside went by the wayside. And I hate to say it like that because it still has an emotional connotation for a lot of people, both inside the industry and for fans of what was Wildside, NWA Wildside. And... You know, I know that you were there for a lot of it, as Dan the Dragon Wilson. Uh, AJ Styles gave you the uh, props on the WWE Network for giving him the moniker of the phenomenal AJ Styles. And then there's another individual that I kind of want to hit you up about for a little bit of information. Was there an evolution between the end of Wildside and the reunion as to the way Bill Barron's handles himself? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think we're all a little bit older, a little bit wiser. Uh, you know, that, that's all a good a good thing with, with years of, you know, experience and uh, a little some triumphs here and some failures there. You certainly, uh, I, I think, yeah, I think we all handled ourselves a little bit differently. Um, you know, he wasn't having to yell at anyone and uh, babysit and, well, we... Uh, <laughs> The rest of us, you know, weren't we're having to be held at or babysat, so it was a good time. <laughs> no, because I, I heard some of the stories about, and Bill even told me a couple of them, there was, a, there was a legendary story that went around where if something didn't go the way it was originally set up, Bill was notorious, or if a match was going notoriously long, Bill had no problem emerging from behind the scenes with a chair in his hand with a look on his face going, now, gentlemen? <laughs> It generally wasn't a chair. That that might be some overblown shit. Um, like he would, but he would come out and like cross his arms and give you the stern <laughs> dad look. Like now, now boys, you you you, you better wrap it up. <laughs> like, and of course, nobody wants to disappoint Bill. So we're like, oh, okay, Bill, God. Uh, <laughs> so it's it 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 
was really fun, like rekindling that atmosphere and seeing. Dude, I saw guys I haven't seen in fifteen years, probably. Um, like Laz, like, for right. crying out loud, one of the great early staples of Wildside, uh, really came out and showed out. Like he had lost a step, um, this like complete. Are you familiar with the last gimmick, may I ask? In passing, yes. In depth, no. Okay, well, he's one of the most popular stars we ever had at Wildside. And uh, if he was ever a heel, I don't remember it. Um, he was a North Carolina guy. I believe he was trained by the Hardy Boys as well. He used to come in the, uh, the Caprice Coleman car. And uh, his gimmick was that uh, he was... I don't know, maybe a gay man, maybe a trans man, I'm not sure. Maybe we, we need to ask Laz that exactly, but uh, who thought he was Britney Spears? Or thought she was Britney Spears. Oh, God. And, uh, um, but also, like, just a, a sex crazed pervert as well. <laughs> so, uh, the last entrance was uh, Oops, I Did It Again by Britney Spears. Right. And, you know, he had his face painted up. He was like, like an extreme Adrian Street, basically. Like, uh, and he came out into the entire Britney dance routine. He's like, you know, in great shape, like ripped up dude. And uh, he would come out and do this dance number around the ring and would make, you know, probably three times his payoff in one uh, as he did his dance around the ring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he would vigorously try to hump his opponents. <laughs> and okay. The, of course. <laughs> You know, in the homophobic South, that was uh, <laughs> something that the heels would just uh, run away from. And it's great because, you know, in the year like 2000, 2001, uh, you know, well before like people were as open-minded as they are now and accepting, um, you had this gay dude getting cheered. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it was the greatest. It was the fucking greatest. Well, see, and it's weird because in certain areas and in certain promotions, and it all depends on the presentation, because you made the reference to one of my favorite individuals in the world of professional wrestling, period, the exotic Adrian Street. There, Even when Adrian, now, this that's the funny thing about it, because characters of that ilk, what you're telling me about Laz and what I know of Adrian Street, depending on the moment, and a lot of that is the moment where somebody like Laz, who would be normally like, hey, Bubba, what the hell's he doing over there? Would all of a sudden, like, hey, Bubba, this guy's good. <laughs> yeah, basically, that, that that's the reaction. I mean, they, they fucking loved Laz. And, and, you know, he was back in full form at the main event last night, hadn't lost a step, uh, you know, just even had a new remix of the the Britney song that ended up in his original music, but it like had some of her more updated songs in it. It was was fucking great. It it was so good. Now, I understand that a good friend of the, a good friend of the Beyond Ringside family, Caprice Coleman actually made it there for a couple minutes the other night. Oh, he did. Well, he was Laz's tag team partner in the main event, actually. Um, You know, 15 years later, a lot of us uh, are are older, as I'd mentioned, and uh, some of us really can't, go in the ring or have retired officially like tank or uh you know maybe just physically aren't able to to do much so so it was a lot of smoke and mirrors you know <laughs> like there was a few really good matches and a lot of really entertaining shit you know like that was kind of the mix <laughs> of it so, so the main event was a tag team match it was caprice coleman uh who's you know in great shape yes. still doing great huge star in ring of honor now so, um, you know, great to see him back. Such a great, oh, yeah. humble dude. Like, one of my favorite people in the business, honestly. Like, he's such a, a kind man. He's such a good dude. He really is. Um, and a talent, you know, such a fucking talent. But, um, so, so him and Laz, you know, the old North Carolina connection, baby faces, that was great. People loved that. You know, Caprice came out to his old nods, you can hate me now. Like, every, everybody came out to all the old music, you know. Like, it, it was so fucking cool. Um, and then they took on Adam Jacobs, who came out in his old suicidal tendencies garb with the fucking parachute pants. Oh, God. And <laughs> Jason Cross. Uh, and Jason Cross, you know, I was talking to him before the show, um, you know, a little background on Jason Cross. At one time, maybe the best independent wrestler in the world. 
like you know when, when he and AJ were uh, were having their feud, you know a lot of people were like, oh, I think Cross might actually be a little better, you know, uh, as good as AJ was, and like you know, I, I mean there were there were certain things that probably he was better than AJ. Like I don't necessarily agree that that he was overall, but he was maybe as good at some point, you know, and that's that's saying enough. Um, but, you know, he had some personal issues and some injuries and, uh, you know, his career was kind of shortened. Right. And, uh, but, you know, he told me before the show that, you know, he hadn't taken a bump in nine years, in nine years. And that damn. guy went out there and <laughs> he looks pretty damn good for a guy that hadn't <laughs> taken a bump in nine years. I mean, we got all the classic spots. We didn't get the crossfire, which I don't blame him. Uh, you know, the shooting star leg drop that was like the move that just blew everybody away back in 2002. Um, like, you know, he, he didn't do that, but uh, he still did the best damn brain buster in North America. You know, a lot of, still a lot of acrobatics and agility from him. Um, he, he looked great out there, and it was so great. Doing that. And Jacobs, I mean, Jacobs, I don't know why the hell he's still not like trying to make a go of it. Like, he still looks good, still mm -hmm. works good. Like, don't, don't look idiot. Like, he looks exactly the same. Like, Cross, you know, he's a little in the face, as we all have. Uh, but uh, but Jacobs, my God, he looks like a vampire bit him. Like, uh, so, um, you know, yeah, he was as good as ever. He looked great in the ring. Uh, they had a great match. And then uh, that proceeded to become a cavalcade of post-match shenanigans. So the, um, the heels won. And then, uh, let's see, it's fucking, I'm trying to remember who all came out like following because it was like a, like I said, it was a cavalcade of cameos. Uh, so, but there was a sequence where several other tag teams hit the ring. Um, the one of them being the Lost Boys. Uh, mm -hmm. and they came out to this huge entrance and then just wandered off, which was hilarious. Um, <laughs> and then Bad <that laughs> Attitude. Uh, came out and hit their finishes on Cross and uh, Jacob. And then Tank and Iceberg came out and ran off Bad Attitude. And then Air Paris came out and did a little speech and brought out Bill to close the show. And then uh, we did the, the video message from the biggest star, of course, from Wildside, AJ Styles. You know, we all thought we were going to get a video message from him, so at least... Um, so the video plays, and there's no sound. Bill starts losing his mind. Of course, it wouldn't be a wild side without a damn technical difficulty. Like, you know, he's <laughs> right. just having a connection in the, in the middle of the ring. And then the fucking lights go out, and the WWE fucking Titan Tron of AJ comes up on the screen, and his music plays, and he comes out. And, of course, as you can imagine, the whole place, just exploded. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he came out and, you know, gave this just amazing speech, putting over the place and talking about, you know, it's where stars are made and uh, you might see the next Stone Cold or Rock or AJ Styles coming through here. And, uh, you know, just, just it was like the greatest moment you could possibly hope for to validate what you've been trying to accomplish for decades or more <laughs> almost two decades now right well i know that there were some people who couldn't make it up there and i know uh one of them in particular is one half of the um well a lot of people know him as one half of the dark city fight club and that's uh cory chavis was originally going to try to be there but extenuating circumstances kept him from making the trip right yeah that was one of the biggest bummers of the whole deal honestly um you know one of my best friends from that era right. like i mean we we still you know talk on facebook uh not as much as we probably should honestly but you know it was like i just have so much love for that dude and um he was one of the heart and soul pieces of wild side so to not have him there was really heartbreaking but and it was heartbreaking for him too because he he wanted to be there as bad as as we wanted him there uh just you know he lives in florida so as you know right. with everything's been going on this week with hurricane irma um he left his house at 6 a.m to try to get there and had gone you know very very little way 
in terms of distance after several hours. So he knew that it really wasn't going to be possible. So he had to turn around. And, you know, I'm glad he did because he's there with his family. Right. Uh, you know, and that hit their house last night. And, and you know, I can confirm that they're okay. Good. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, you know, they, they had some damage in their yard. but And, you know, minor water damage coming in their house. But uh, nothing nothing too bad so you know uh he's he's good but uh yeah so uh it, it sucked that he couldn't be there he couldn't be there and john phoenix of suicidal tendencies couldn't be there right. for the same reason and uh stone mountain who is a state trooper now for south carolina <laughs> he may not be a state trooper he's a police officer but uh it, it, in the state of South Carolina, you know, due to all hands on deck for emergency services, right. basically trying to prep for things, he had to to report to duty. So, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Um, and then there were some others that were said they were going to be there. You know, I'm not going to to bury anybody, but there were definitely people that confirmed that just didn't show up. So, not sure what that was about. Well, uh, you know, the biggest fucking star on the planet didn't have a problem showing up. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard he even brought the U.S. title with him. <laughs> yeah, of course he did. Like, I mean, he clearly had to get permission to do that. So, you know. Well, and you got to think, considering that as high on the roster as A.J. is right now, not only with the U.S. title, but, of course, in the pecking order nowadays, um, you've got in probably the top two or three on the blue brand. Uh, for him to be able to swing a Saturday night off when you know that SmackDown's going to be doing a house show somewhere, uh, it's a case point scenario where that's where everybody in attendance, and this is something I'm, I'm kind of marking out for the situation, but at the same time, I'm also understanding the analytics of business on this, knowing that he's one of the biggest stars on the blue brand. For him to swing that night off, to make it to Cornelia for the Wild Side reunion, and be able to surprise everybody like that, that's got to go down as one of the biggest moments in the in whether you call it the Church of Southern Wrestling, forty two thirty six Level Grove Road in Cornelia, or you call it the Landmark Arena, the surprise appearance for everybody there. That's got that's going to be hopefully one that people talk about. It's like he got away from the E to come down to this. You have to think about that for a second, kids. Well, you, you got to think, like, with Triple H's influence, who seems to, you know, I think Finn Balor did something similar to his old stomping grounds in ICW in Ireland. Um, so, you know, they, they seem to have been, and I think I read where somebody else did something similar. They, they seem to be more receptive to uh, working with, you know, the local indies. We know they're working with Evolve. And I think, you know, it's, it, I mean, it doesn't hurt them. What does it hurt them for, for you know, a guy, it only helps them. It only makes them look good. It so. impro- yeah, it improves the PR factor because, and I'm not going to knock another promotion, although it's going to sound really bad what I'm about to say, um, considering that it would normally take an act of God Congress in the 82nd Airborne for someone who was under the banner at that time of TNA Wrestling to be able to make appearances. You had to jump through so many hoops in order to get, and we're not even talking about top tier talent over there. We're talking about mid card talent. If you were trying to, well, go ahead. We, we had to jump through less because of Bill, thankfully. But go yeah, ahead. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. But <laughs> that's an advantage y'all did have. But there, I mean, it's like there are other companies where they would try to bring in even mid card talent from TNA, and it's like, well, you got to do this, 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 and this, and they can't do this, but they can possibly do this. Blah 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 blah. And it's like all of a sudden, uh, why am I wanting to bring them in anymore? And then, lo and behold, you're right, because remember, when the Hardys went over with the Raw Tag Team titles at Mania, they still had contractual obligations, and they were showing up at these other companies in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic with the Raw Tag Team titles. And everybody's going, oh my God, and I'm sitting back going, this is PR. This is what the E needs right now is positive press, and AJ showing up there, like I said, just a capper on a great night for so many people. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if it's something like where they're going to do a DVD of him, then, I mean, you know, it's a great story. I can see why they did it, you know, like, oh, we can put this footage on here and show, you know, how how he came back to where it all started. And, you know, this this fucking, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Now, I want to flip the script because 
I want to know about your voice in the overall scheme of things when it comes to calling action and being a part of it all with Wildside. Yeah, sure. Like, what do you mean, my my physical voice? Like, how? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm talking. About, I know you've had various tag team partners, in particular, that you um, were working with over there at Wildside, plus some of the other passing talent that came through, some of the matches you were able to call. I'm going to throw this one at you. I mean, I know you and Stephen Prezak were a tag team at one time, right? We were the tag team. Right. We were the Wild Side announced team. We got to reunite Saturday night. Right. Like, there were other announced teams here and there, but for the we had the longest run, and, and it was hundreds of episodes together by far of anybody. If there was one match that could be recreated today, here's the if then, if, if I knew then what I know now, as far as being able to go behind a microphone. If there is one match right off the top of your head, it doesn't have to be the earth-shattering epiphany match that you and Prezak could call right now as it took place then, what would it be? Oh, easy. Uh, it would have been the uh, – and I, he, Prezak wasn't even with me at the time, but it would have been the uh, my debut commentary match, uh, which was not my debut match, but debut show, uh, was Air Paris versus AJ Styles versus Sabu in a three-way dance. <laughs> And I was thrown out there because, like, they did the show on a Thursday and there was a snowstorm. So Al and Stephen Prezak were the normal announced team, but due to whatever, they couldn't be there. Uh, and it was like a last minute thing. So Bill was like, all right, well, you're up. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd just been like the ring announcer at that point. Right. Uh, and and I, I did an okay job. Like I like they thought I did a great job for a guy that had no fucking experience hardly. But um, like you know, I was so green and said so many fucking stupid over the top things. I would would really like the opportunity to go back and call that again with a, a fresh you know pair of eyes and a, a wealth of experience under my belt with Prezak. Because like I mean, me and him. Dude, we got together, and I mean, yeah, we we talked over each other a couple of times, and it wasn't like a oh, we were out of sync thing. It was like we got so excited about the shit yeah. that was going on, we just yeah. couldn't contain ourselves. You know, uh, we had the chemistry just as we did back in the day. It was like nothing changed. Um, you know, and I've invited him to come back to Anarchy and do some guest spots here and there. On a moment like that, when you are talking with Prezak, do you feel that much younger again, or does time actually set in? I mean, I know how I would feel, but I wonder how you feel on this. Man, a little of both. Like, you know, like feeling the energy, it was definitely like the clock just turned back. It was blowing my fucking mind all night long. Like, from the first match where... Slim J came out as Slim J again with the bleached hair to the Eminem music with the probation officers and the handcuffs <laughs> uh, with his old gear and the bleached hair and everything. Um, to and it, you know wrestled Kid Cool who was the, he later became Seth Delay uh, who came out in his old G-rated gear to the fucking new kids on the block the right stuff like it was just it was freaking me out man. Uh, but it was so cool. It was so, so cool. But then again, like I said, part of me, like I look over and I see the gray and Prezak's hair and, and beard and, you know, I can see myself in the monitor and I'm not a fucking spring chicken either. So, you know, t time was, was still ever present. You make a reference to Laz and the Britney Spears. You make a reference to the new kids on the block. Not necessarily from this past weekend, but overall, who had the music that just made you go, are you really serious? Oh, man, there's always been some. Um, not as much in the Wild Side era, because we, we really policed the music. And guys have had better taste in music then, I think. You know, I think anytime you heard something that was just overdone, like some generic ass ACDC. Like, man, I love some ACDC, but, you know, we've joked on here how many times about how ACDC is like the boilerplate independent wrestling music, you know, like TNT. Okay. That made sense that they had ACDC, but we even got like a 
pop punk version of it that was like a little faster. Yeah, you know, for them to, to just kind of because you know we were like the hip modern thing at the time. It wasn't like you know Wild Side was different in that respect. Like Anarchy when it first started, very much tried to be very old school Southern territory, and that worked great because they hadn't seen that in a while. But Wild Side was like cutting edge, like uh, you know, in the same way that ECW was in many ways. I mean, with still some of that Southern influence. It's often been described as the bastard child of ECW and Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I think that's about the perfect way to describe (laughs) Wild Side. Oh, Lord. Now, like I said, there's so many different directions I want to go with questions, but I I don't want to stray too far away from it. Um, it. Is this something you wish would happen yearly or at least every other every couple of years? Yeah, I, I mean, even if there's not a show, you know, I think at some point a show becomes impossible due to time. But, you know, I would love for us to get together once a year, once every couple of years at least, and just catch up and see each other. You know, there's still a lot of guys that, that there were guys we couldn't track down. Uh, we couldn't track down the Cole twins and then come to find out, at least through the grapevine, and I have not confirmed this, and if anyone out there listening can, uh, you know, or wants to debunk it, that would be even better, preferably, uh, that uh, one of the Cole twins passed away a few years ago hmm. in a car accident. Um, so, and I don't know which one, uh, you know, and there was Keith and Kent. Those were, they were great dudes, man. <laughs> they were a really integral part of early wild side and and you know everybody remembers him from wcw is like the mullet dudes like kind of the high flying tag team but they got jacked up and they were big dudes anyway they were like six four six five each and uh they were like you know got this biker look going on they had all these tattoos and bleached hair these giant sideburns and uh they were jeff g bailey's like muscle in the nwa elite and uh Oh, dude, they were just fucking they're hilarious dudes and great dudes to hang out with. And we, we had a lot of good times with those guys. And, uh, man, that really fucked me up to hear that. So I hope it isn't true. But if anybody knows, uh, I would like confirmation on that. Let's go in that direction. You brought up Bailey. And, you know, in the world of wrestling in the southeastern U.S., there are a few managers that really just stick in the minds of people. I mean, I'm, I'm very much of the ilk that not everybody who walks to ringside with somebody is a manager. Even in the male gender. Because you have some males that just are not good managers, therefore, in my book, they are valets. <laughs> so, I mean... Oh, there's plenty. <laughs> yeah, buddy. I mean, and there's four in particular, there's three in particular that always popped the, the, in my book. And I'm not saying th- this because we're acquaintances. I'm not saying this because we've met and we've broken bread. And I like to call us friends and comrades in arms or brothers in arms as well. I do put you near that top right alongside. And I bring in a longtime friend of mine, the wicked nemesis, um, the Oracle of Ominous. I bring in Jeff G. Bailey. And as far as different personas that just stick in the mind. Now, of course, in later days, I finally had a chance to meet and work with Al Getz, um, courtesy of another promotion in the state of Georgia, Peach State Wrestling Alliance. Um, Had a chance to work with Getz a few times. Really great character. Always enjoyed hanging around him and talking to him and going back in time on that one. But as far as the wild side era, managers who just stuck in your brain and go, wow, okay, cool, run with it. Um, uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, well, of course, Bailey, you know, there, he was the best manager of Wildside. But, uh, you know, Mr. Wildside, Steve Martin, was a great manager as well. And, you know, he had, he had an interesting story. And, oh, my God, he was there. And I hadn't seen that guy in, in I know, 15 years. Um, very cool to catch up with him. He, you know, I don't actually give him enough credit honestly for um molding a lot of my early like he taught me a lot in my early days in the business uh he was the original promoter of ncw uh he started promoting ncw in 1995 and he fucking uh 
like he had done some acting and shit, so he'd had a little bit of Hollywood experience. Not not the not the Steve Martin. Uh, he was actually because his name was Steve Martin when he was an actor. He changed his name to Chance Williams, yeah. and uh, he <laughs> he used that name early on as a commentator. And he was the commentator of NCW for years, and the early commentator of Wildside, but then also revealed as the owner of the promotion. He was a babyface owner for a while. They did a big angle with Jeff G. Bailey when he was managing K. Crush, uh, who you know is now our truth uh, against AJ Styles in a feud where Steve was like AJ's big supporter, and they like you know attacked Steve and shaved his head and kidnapped his wife and all this other shit there you go um it, it, and you know so steve but steve eventually turned heel and joined them and became a heel manager of his own he was a great manager actually he got a ton of heat and he had this like foghorn leghorn like delivery that was just the fucking bath awesome. uh, <laughs> and uh so yeah so steve martin was a great manager um al Getz was great he was a part of a lot of big shit in the early wild side days um even prior to bailey like you know when bailey was on the rise Getz was kind of on top already right um you know he he was managing scotty ran in the big early feuds with rick michaels that um you know kind of drove the first year or so of wild side um and that was great uh, but another manager that i loved and you know people say he's, he's just dreadful in his memphis run and blah 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 but um we had nothing but gold out of him. That was Big Business Brown. Um, you may remember him from Memphis wrestling in the early 90s. A little bit. Um, he was actually broke in by the Poffos. Um, and I guess he was a friend of theirs or something. And uh, he became a manager. And as a, like a lead serious manager, not great. But what we did, we made him Jeff G. Bailey's lackey. And so we called him his money mark. I mean, financial consultant. <laughs> um, and he was the greatest lackey in the history of wrestling. Um, so good. And like he would just sit out there and just sweat buckets. <laughs> like he had the sweat rag. You know, he's just fucking poor. He's a big fat guy. He's just fucking poor and sweat. You know, in his suit. With his briefcase that that had Jeff G. Bailey's money in it, and uh, <laughs> and like any time that you know he was always like the setup to to get to Bailey. So you know, so, like one time trash that gave him a wedgie or something. White trash. who was like our hardcore guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave him a wedgie or something in a vignette, and he's like, "Oh, you wait till the council hears about this." Oh, <laughs> like, like he's just. It was the greatest lackey in professional wrestling history, and he was there Saturday night, and they reunited with with Bailey and the Elite. I hadn't seen him in years, and you know I'm hoping to have him back. He's he's interested in coming back to Anarchy, so we Jeff G. Bailey's financial consultant could very well be returning soon, folks. <laughs> now, one other little direction I want to hit on before I go to the heart of the batting order on something, because you've already mentioned his name, and I'm going to come back around to him. One of the most overlooked commodities in pro wrestling is the official referee. Some of the refs that were part of the Wild Side era. Which one's stick in your brain? Oh, oh, man, we had some of the best refs in independent wrestling history. I don't know of any independent company. I mean, you look at a great track record of talent. I mean, certainly OVW would boast a higher success rate of guys in the uh, the major leagues, but I don't know of anybody besides them, as far as independent promotions, that could boast the uh, the number of in-ring talents that we had that, that went on to get jobs. But as far as referees, we had at least three referees that got jobs. Um, starting with Jamie Tucker, uh, well-known as the WCW ref, but mm -hmm. he started as a wild side ref, and when he got let go from WCW... Came right back to Wildside. Um, <laughs> uh, great dude, you know. He he was. I think he he got over just initially because he was the only like ginger ref <laughs> that anybody had ever seen. But he was a good ref. Um, he came down from North Carolina, and uh, good dude, like super nice. And so yeah, he went on and got a job 
he was the first, and then we had Andrew Thomas, who went on to get a job in TNA, and then, you know, started as a ref, but also, like, he'd mainly got the gig because of his production experience, because he was the producer and editor for the Wild Side TV, and uh, he ended up becoming the editor for TNA, and he's still the editor for TNA to this day. Hmm. Which is pretty amazing, considering all of the turnover in that company over yeah, the years. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I mean, he, he's one of the original employees of the company, and he's still there. I think, like, him and Jeremy Borash are probably <laughs> the only people that can say that. Or possibly even Don West, who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, he really ended up turning that into a huge opportunity behind the scenes, but was also the greatest ref I've ever worked with. Ever. Like, a damn shame he never got picked up by WWE. He might have been too good for WWE. I, I know that's silly, but I know they want their refs to be a little more nondescript. You normally want a ref to be a little more nondescript, but he's like the most animated ref you've ever seen, and in, not in a way that takes away from the match, but only enhances it. Like, um, I remember when Abyss used to do the big choke slam spot, and they would hit the mat. Like, he would take a bump when they hit this fucking mat to sell this giant fucking slamming this guy down, you know, and would crawl over. Like I said, but he was always just perfect about the timing. He never did in a way that put the spotlight on him. But if you watched him, like, he was as entertaining as the fucking mats. <laughs> just his reactions to shit. Um, so good. And then he did a lengthy as a heel ref for a while uh, when Bailey took over ownership of the company and put him in charge as the senior official. And uh, he was a great heel as well. He had a ton of fucking heat. Uh, it's just, just, just amazing. He was great. And then Mike Posey, of course. Of course. Uh, ref two WrestleManias, uh, was a wild side ref for many years. And he refed on the, the show Saturday night, which was great. And not only did he ref, but he appeared in the Mega Rumble as Kid USA. And then again at the end as P Dog. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's cool. And he, and he thought he won the Mega Rumble. He celebrated it and talked about all of his accomplishments until the final member of the Mega Rumble entered, who was New Jack. <laughs> and Posey eliminated himself, and New Jack won the Mega Rumble. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you know... And this is something I'm 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 going to break out character for a hot second, and I'm just going to go and sit back and say this, Mike Posey. And I'm going to kill I'm going to kill something on this one, so please forgive me, Mike. I've worked with Posey on so many different occasions, and it's always I, I'm just going to use the word it's a blessing when he's on the card, because he's somebody that I can talk to, but I mean genuinely talk to, because. Under normal circumstances, for all the different things that he's done, whether it be Alabama Attitude, he himself is Mike Posey, whether it be P-Dog, da-da-da-da-da-da, keep going. Um, there are times when he is one of the most quiet, introspect. I don't want to use the word introspective, but I'm going to use it, um, unassuming characters in a locker room. You know how when you go into a locker room and it's like everybody seems like, even without a camera around, they're fighting for um, FaceTime. And oh, yeah. Posey is just one of the most genuine professionals that I've ever worked with. And that's that, like I said, I said the word before and I'll say it again. People like him are a blessing for this business. They come in, they work hard, they do their thing the right way. They, they, shh, the word professional is an understatement. But like I said, I don't want to kill Posey's he because he's great as a heel. And he's also good as a babyface character too, but like I said, just people like him, I genuinely enjoy being around. So that that to hear what he pulled on that one just it makes me sit back and go, you know something, he can pull that off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, Posey's a great dude. I've known him like he's one of the people I've probably known the longest in the business. Um, I met him before I ever went to Wildside, around like 1999, like late '99. Uh, over in Dalton, Georgia, working for TWA, uh, he would come in as a ref with the crew from Alabama with Jack Lord and uh, Adam Roberts and Monster Man. 
and uh you know they would come and do the shows and there were always a carload that came together and that that's when i first got to know posey so god i've known him for for legit almost 20 years well i know that i think it was over 300 episodes of wild side television yeah and those are still available out there in the stratosphere right now aren't they most all of them are on YouTube. Um, unfortunately, they weren't cataloged worth a shit, Bill. <laughs> so, I, I mean, actually, I can't blame Bill. It was the Cole promo media guy who put them up there for Bill. Um, but like, they're they're episode numbered, you know. But most of them don't have match listing, so it's all there. But you got to kind of look for it, right? So, um, but it's there, you know, like everything with the big shows and, you know, you can still buy the big shows from Bill. So email him at showbiz at AOL.com if you want to purchase any of the old big shows because he still ain't putting them out on YouTube. You'd think after fucking 20 years, he'd no. be like, all right, we can just put these on YouTube now. But but no, you still got to get a DVD, <laughs> so hit him up. <laughs> Hold on, let me, let, me, let me see if I can get this. Hold on, let me adjust the treble. Well... Daniel, what you have to do. <laughs> I couldn't go any further. I lost it. Oh, damn it. Was um, I even close? I, I fucking love Bill. It was so good to see him. I had <laughs> seen him in forever. And, you know, we we had some laughs and some hugs and bitched each other a little bit. <laughs> it was a good time. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me throw this name out there. And like I said, um, Rick Michaels, the chosen one, if you will tumultuous run all of the above but as over the last few years has become one of the most respected names in this industry in our neck of the woods uh worse with anarchy um now with uh why, well rest, while we wrestle then anarchy that, or, which is it this week it is still anarchy right <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, no, it's anarchy. It, it will be anarchy for the duration. <laughs> I know. We've but, expanded our brand. It includes anarchy and our Friday night show in as well. Um, also, Peach State Wrestling Alliance. Also, one of the producers for uh, Scenic City. Uh, just recently came off the Scenic City Invitational. Yeah, we got our fingers in a little bit of all the pots. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, actually, I've been asked, so I'm going to go ahead and use this forum. Um, actually, in the month of October, um, scheduling permitting, I'm looking forward to making a return to Peach State Wrestling a lot. So I'll go ahead and throw that one out there, too. Um, but nice. when you have an opportunity to know someone and their history and see how Rick Michaels has taken the direction of his life in this business, how big's the smell? Oh, it's huge. I mean, you still have people who want to fucking try to bury him over shit and situations they don't really know nothing about. I mean, like, he, he'll be the first one to tell you he did horrible shit. He also did hard time in prison and paid a debt to society. Uh, he's also been working in the business for a decade trying to improve that reputation since all that shit happened. I mean, there's also people there that allowed him back in that position that police any potential and you know what i mean like yeah. it's just I, I think you know I, i've seen a couple of people throwing some shade at him since the, the publicity of this is hit um and you know all i gotta say is like you don't know the situation like yeah it was incredibly fucked up he's done everything he can to make amends um you you should fucking trust the people that you knew there anyway uh, and maybe reach out to them before burying the guy on social media. But that's all I'm going to say about that unless I have to, to go into more detail. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm extremely proud of Rick. Like, uh, you know, he knows what a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity he got to get redemption. Um, he's done everything right, you know, and it's been a pleasure working with him. And I was as apprehensive as anybody based on the history. But, you know, I'd seen his track record. And, you know, I had a heart to heart with him myself. And, uh, you know, we, we came to a mutual understanding to work together and, you know, have rebuilt our friendship in the process of this uh, closer than it's ever been because, you know, there's when bad shit happens and people fuck up and, and they've got to make amends, you know, you just, when, when, when you open up like that, 
you just get closer with people. So right. yeah, like I, nothing, nothing but good things to say about him at this point in his life. Yeah, and unfortunately, when Bill picked, okay, and Bill was the executive producer, blah blah blah, for NWA Wildside, and unfortunately, I believe that he also gave up the rights to the name when he originally took his uh, took a producer's job with uh, WWE, right? He didn't give up the rights to the name. They forced him to close the company when he took that job because Vance said we were a conflict of interest. With Deep South. Which was the greatest compliment we were ever paid up until this past <laughs> Saturday when AJ came back. Um, like, you know, like that, that we were enough on his radar to say, nah, like we, we basically got the territory buyout deal from the 80s, which no one had gotten in years. So, yeah, it was pretty dope. <laughs> but uh you know so he did have to close it down and i mean you know it it was i, I don't want to say it was waning but you know he he was considering closing it even before that happened and i, I believe and he he will probably correct me if he hears this but uh, i believe it was because you know he thought maybe something more full-time with tna was coming on the horizon to where he probably couldn't really still run the show he had you know he had been missing a lot of the later shows anyway because of his responsibilities with TNA. But then when the WWE thing came along, like, you know, it was, it was clear. Um, unfortunately, I, you know, it's one of those alternate history things. Like what would have happened had deep South replaced wild side or better yet had wild side stayed in business and just became the WWE development territory. Right. Because that was originally what was talked about. Um, Tommy dreamer, who was an executive at the time had to come down to Cornelia to the building and scope it out and report back to Vince. And, you know, now with all of the upgrades, I think, you know, had it looked like that at the time, then maybe things would have been different. But, you know, he was just like, oh, my God, if Vince ever comes in here, like, Tommy's like, I love it. Like, this is wrestling to me. You know, this is where wrestling lives and breathes in places like this. But if Vince ever comes in here, he will lose his shit. <laughs> so <laughs> we cannot do wild side. Uh, as the development territory. So we will hire you to come open one with Jody Hamilton. Um, and that worked out like a bag of dicks. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> now, you've talked about it. I've talked about it. Andrew's talked about it um, in passing. Tank's talked about it. And for those who don't know, like I said, for those who were there and for no, those who know the the history of the building, once again, it has been called the, the Church of Southern Wrestling. Now it's the Landmark Arena, 4236 Level Grove Road. You talk about the, imp we've heard about the improvements. You've seen the improvements. You were there for the improvements. I haven't been there for the improvements. I would have probably ended up with a paintbrush in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> not kidding. It happens that way, believe it or not. But <laughs> during the Wild Side Run, let people know, and you just kind of hinted at it a second ago when you were talking about Dreamer coming down. But I want you to go ahead and pass along to everybody exactly what the building was like. Oh, in those days? Yeah. My God. It, I, I mean, you know, sweltered in the summer, freezing cold in the winter, just basically uh, a a big stack of shit on a foundation. Um, like, <laughs> it, it was a 1,000 year old school gymnasium. Um, not literally a thousand years, but at least like a hundred or more. And I mean, they're like so, so old that it's like haunted with all these ancient spirits. <laughs> I'm not even shitting you. Like we, we slept in the ring one time after a, a Friday night. So we just like closed it up and had a huge party in the building with all the boys. And, uh, we all crashed out and passed out in the ring. And we all, like, woke up, like, late at night to the sound of children laughing and basketballs dribbling on the floor. So that was fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, it, I mean, it was, it was just, like, a falling apart, you know? Like, just the decrepit, decaying, like, the worst piece of shit you can imagine. And it still looks like that on the outside. But on the inside, everything's been completely remodeled. It looks like a, a classic old TV studio. It looks great. You know, and I, I, I've i almost turned this into an interview-style format, and I didn't mean to run away with it. I swear I didn't. But there were so many no, questions. No, it's fine. 
there were some <laughs> there were so many questions that I wanted to ask. Just like there's a, there's questions that everybody wants to ask about that era because I mean, it was two um it was six years six and a half years that still is talked about today as it pertains to the culture of wrestling. And that's why it's like, and because there's people listening, I'm sure that they're, whether you're listening live or listening on the replay, first off, thank you. Um, but when you hear the words NWA Wildside or Wildside, and you know the, some of the names that came through, and some of the, okay, I'm not just going to say names, I'm going to say the personas that came through. Because when I mentioned Corey a little while ago, a lot of people sit back and say, Corey Javis? Wait a minute. Well, but, but, but Rain Man. See what yep. I mean? Dan? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, he, it was Rain Man. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but therein lies the funny part. Whether it's leaving the individual out of it, but coming back to the personas, the more memorable ones that stick with you. Well, as I mentioned before, Laz, um, yeah. some that I wish we'd have got to see. We got to see a little bit. Total Destruction. They were great. Oh my God, they were great. Um, but we only saw Rusty Riddle. We were never able to track down Sean Royal. So, um, but they were they were just amazing. Like they they were two guys who you know were pretty well known in the business at that point for various other things. Sean Royal was one half of the New Breed with Chris Champion back right. in the Crockett days and. Uh, Rusty Riddle was like a long time enhancement guy and mid Atlantic staple. Um, you know, if you've watched any mid Atlantic wrestling, you saw Rusty Riddle in underneath matches. Um, you know, big dude, but they, they reinvented themselves as this biker gimmick called Total Destruction. And like, they were like legit badass dudes, man. Uh, they came out usually with like a case of beer, you know. Hey! And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to go out to like for whom the bell tolls on Metallica, and people just ate their shit up. They had the most hilarious promos. Uh, I remember one time Bill got fucking pissed at them because I was 19 years old in the middle of the ring as the ring announcer, and they made me funnel a fucking beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was like he's underage. <laughs> they get ringside yelling at him. <laughs> Damn it, you can't do that. <laughs> oh my god, it was so great. Um so yeah, like those guys are some of my favorite personas. White trash was always great. Mr. Delicious, Iceberg, like the original, like being of inconceivable horror, Abdullah style monster iceberg. You know, he says a great worker does, has evolved much over the years, but you know, his original run with Bailey as the killer is one of the greatest things ever in wrestling. Um, Caprice Coleman's early character is uh, Muhammad Ali and yes. Babyface. Like, I really wish he would kind of go back to some of that in, in Ring of Honor. He was so charismatic doing it. Um, suicidal tendencies in the tab and just their ridiculousness. Um so fucking many. Tony Mamaluke, the Lost Boys. Uh, what a great, great fucking tag team they were. Uh, and unfortunately, I'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and spill the beans because Larry Goodman did in his report. It, it, we had to use a fake Gabriel because the real Gabriel elected not to participate. So. Ah. But, you know, we we had a, a dear friend of the family who uh, knew all the mannerisms and slapped a wig on him since they were just coming down for the little silly spot, you know, like, then the lights were down most of the time. I don't, some people noticed, but most people didn't. To which I will sit back and say, Larry, damn it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, let me, Larry, could, Larry knew, you know. <laughs> well, still, but by the same token, leave a little bit of the mystique in the situation. Yeah, so that that was kind of a bummer. Like, there's a lot of guys I wish could have made it. Uh, Tony Stradlin didn't make it. Uh, you know, he was Todd Sexton's partner in TNT for years. And right. Later went on to become Tony Santarelli and uh, now has a career in the adult film industry. Hey, so, uh, there you go. He's a, he's a busy guy. But 
that he couldn't make it. Um, a lot of the guys did send videos. Uh, Hasta Fernandez, Rudy Boy Gonzalez, Arthur, Jim Mitchell, Terry Taylor, uh, Delirious, the Briscoes, Jay Lethal, Sal Renaro, uh you know, also a lot of the guys that, that couldn't make it did at least send videos, and that right. was cool. Like Amazing Red sent one, and then uh, uh, what was cool is Zack Ryder sent one just because he was a fan of the show. Like He, he never worked for us. He did send a video because he, he used to watch the show all the time. Absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm going to shut up, step back out of the way for a second. I'm going to let you continue on on some of the things that you wanted to bring up about it. Like I said, I, I, I apologize for kind of hijacking the episode, but there were so many questions I wanted to ask. Oh, you're good. Tanks want to fucking want to talk about it anyway. So it's not like we're, we're missing out on anything here. We, we just got a couple minutes left. So I was just saying, you know, some of the guys that I'd, I'd hope to see there that didn't make it, um, you know, uh, murder one was, was no, no in casa. I'm not sure what happened with him. Uh, Jimmy Rave was no in casa. Not sure what happened to him. Uh, it was great to see Luke Hawks. He's doing great things. Uh, he had a hell of a match with Anthony Henry. Uh, let's see, uh, like I said, the Cole twins. You know, we were missing those guys. Uh, there, there were definitely some guys that we wish could have been there that weren't. But we still had a great contingent of the. The old timers there. Oh, J.C. Daz had, you know, he was one of the guys that allegedly was going to be there. And then, you know, we found out, I guess, the day of that he wasn't coming, whatever. But, um, you know, he was always one of my favorite guys to watch in Wild Side. He was so good. Uh, so we didn't, didn't get to see him. So, you know, we missed out on a lot of guys. So hopefully we can do it again next year or year after. You know, like I said, I, we don't even have to do a show. I would just like to do or you know, fucking do a barbecue and a Q&A and, you know, that like, works. Uh, you know, drink beers and have a good time and, uh, you know, not worry about a show. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to top this one. Less drama, less <laughs> stress. We're going to be any younger. So. <laughs> Normally less drama and less stress that way. Yeah, yeah, that that would be my preference, you know, like like they do with the Gulf Coast reunion. Instead of just instead of doing a show, you know, let's just get do together. a convention. That that would be fine by me. You know, it's really surprising because I know how close it was to Dragon Con, and um, actually, we have not spoken since Dragon Con weekend, have we? No. Um, we got a little time to play with. If you want to shift over, did you have a chance to go this year? Yeah, I did. The, the the wrestling was good, man. Um, it was probably the most well ran. Uh, Rick Michaels again running hey. the uh, <laughs> the production area, like kept it a tight ship. So it was like the quickest Dragon Con show in, in history. There were thousands upon thousands of people there, and there was some you know pretty good wrestling this year, which is generally not what we strive for on those shows. But it was a great bonus. Um, so, yeah, I had a good time there and then went and did the con. And, I mean, like, we didn't take in any panels or anything. We just went and partied and met people and saw people we, you know, saw the year before. And, you know, just the, looked at costumes and all that cool shit. There's, there's not a lot to report on it, but it was a good time. Yes, once again, I was actually supposed to make it over there, and I ended up having to work two jobs that day. No, uh, what a bummer. <laughs> it's like, well, case point scenario, a week ago, I had... 40-yard line seat for myself, I was going solo, to the UAB return, the home opener for the University of Alabama Birmingham Football Blazers. Lo and behold, I had situations come up, personal situations came up, and I had ticket, 40-yard line, wasn't able to go. But. What a shit. (laughs) Hey, we won. Okay, I'm good with that anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it's like, and you have situations where, like I said, there may have been some people who wanted to hit, but I've wanted to hit Dragon Con for the longest time. And it's just timing for me sucks sometimes. Kind of like this past Saturday, I wanted to make the trip, but with everything going on over here, and I'm trying to keep communication down in Florida with certain people, I just, I, I let the world get away from me. So that's my fault. But next year... If it happens, stay out of my way because I'll be there if I have to. I'm not going to say the end of that sentence. It depends on who I have to bribe <laughs> to get out of, <laughs> to get my fucking ass out of Birmingham. But actually, um, before that, long before, 
Um, I know that we're going to have another Wind Worlds Collide moment. Are you going to be a part of the Scenic City Trios on the 18th of November? Yep, I'll be doing commentary on that show, so um, looking forward to it. Opening channels with uh, Josh, Scott, and Dylan uh, to start working with them on doing some crossover on the network over here. Kind of like going to Shameless Plug thing. Uh, because actually this year, or for uh, trios, want to see what we can do about a uh, hmm, possible live remote. Oh, that'd be cool. That would be very cool. Going to be at Hickson High School this year, a new yep. facility uh, for the Scenic City group. And a lot of great folks have been announced for the trios. The Viking War Party, uh, tonight uh, the Carnies, uh, but tonight they just added uh, the Lynch Bob and Kyle Matthews, the great six-man team. Uh, going to be a good time. Follow them on Twitter at SCI Tournament. I'm going to get a quick plug in here before we say goodbye for the upcoming Anarchy Wrestling event on September 23rd. Uh, it'll take AJ Styles' advice. Support wrestling at the Landmark Arena. You never know who the next big star is going to be that comes through there. But uh, i got a pretty good idea, and he's going to be in the main event on September 23rd. And uh, his name is Gunnar Miller. And there's another guy. He's defending we were talking about Anarchy Wrestling on the 23rd. Uh, just said we we're going to have a pair of three-way dance contendership matches for the big titles. One will be for the Anarchy Tag Team titles as the Hate Junkies, the Lynch Mob, and Team Tag face off. And another three-way dance for the uh, shot at the Heritage title held by Kyle Matthews. It'll be Jeremy Foster taking on Wild Billy Buck and taking on A.J. Gray with the winner of that matchup getting a shot at Kyle Matthews and the Anarchy Heritage title somewhere down the line. Um, all of that plus the seven-foot nearly madman from the Ozarks, Alex Rudolph returns. We've got women's action. Uh, we've got a whole lot more on September 23rd. You definitely want to be there at the Landmark Arena. Brad Cash, Death Wish Brad Cash returns from suspension. Uh, will we hear anything about Matt Riddle responding to Gunnar Miller's open challenge where he has called him out for a rematch to take place at the Church of Southern Wrestling, the Landmark Arena. Uh, all of that we'll find out hopefully on September 23rd. You want to be there. Follow us on Twitter at Anarchy Landmark, Facebook.com slash Anarchy Wrestling, and uh, let us know what you think. You can also subscribe to Anarchy Television on Powerbomb.tv, $9.99 a month content from all over the world that just uh, got a message from Gerard from Powerbomb TV advising that they added three new promotions from Canada, uh, hundreds of promotions from across the globe, $10 a month. Use the promo code ANARCHY when you sign up and get 20 days free of charge on us. Uh, you definitely want to check out Powerbomb.tv. Not only can you get all of the regular Anarchy television, but all of our quarterly big events. Um, I'm assuming the Wild Side Reunion are eventually going to be on there, but I know they are wanting to do a DVD release initially. So um, follow me on Twitter at Dragons Redux. You can also follow me on Facebook at Rev Dan the Dragon Wilson. And uh, that's all I've got for tonight, Eddie. You, any closing comments? I wish I could have been there. It sounds like it was an absolute blast and then some. Oh, it, it was truly something else, man. Truly something else. All right. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and sign off here. Thanks for bearing with us. Sorry for the technical difficulties there at the end. Uh, hopefully we'll be back next week with Andrew Alexander and Tank to talk more about the Wild Side Reunion and Tank's experience. But until then, keep one foot in the gutter and one fist in the gold. I'm Dan the Dragon Wilson. Good night. <laughs>